<laughs> Aha, now <laughs> we are live. Uh, so I'm here today with a very special guest joining me. It's uh, Scott Baker. Um, Scott, for those who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Um, I am a full-time fiction writer. I, I write uh, mostly uh, fantasy fiction, but some science fiction as well. Um, and uh, a part-time uh, uh, philosopher, I guess. Um, and uh, lately, a, uh, a carpenter. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I uh, uh, kind of look at myself as being uh, um, extra institutional. Uh, um, so I sort of uh, look at my uh, uh, lack of affiliation with, with any institution you know, dealing with, say, you know, issues in philosophy of mind or cognitive science. I, I uh, look at that as uh, actually uh, an opportunity to, to exploit. So um, what I really strive to do in my work is to try to rethink problems in ways that uh, um, might be laughed at in, in uh, institutional contexts where, where uh, um, you know, uh, the, the micro norms of, uh, of uh, simply progressing through, uh, you know, a, a given educational system um, uh, could be uh, constraining, you know, consciously or, or otherwise. Um, and I also uh, strive to be as interdisciplinary as I possibly can. So I, I like to describe myself uh, as, a, as a water bug. Uh, uh, about a mile wide or a mile wide and an inch deep, <laughs> leaping from silo to silo to silo, pissing off as many specialists as I as I possibly can, <laughs> but always always striving to uh, um, pull together the the most uh, uh, parsimonious, uh, coherent story uh, um, I possibly can for uh, um, cognitive phenomena, largely. Well, it's, it's certainly great to have you and, you know, your writing is, is, is wonderful, I think. And so it's very rare that you find someone who's a philosopher and also a great writer. <laughs> so we need more people like you, I think, to, <laughs> to liven up the discussion. Um, uh, that's certainly true. And, and also, I mean, what's interesting is that I, if, when I was looking into your background is that you were in a PhD program in philosophy. Yeah, yeah, And you basically completed, I mean, you did what we call ABD, which is all but dissertation. Um, so is this what you were studying as philosophy of mind and cognitive science when you were there? Um, well, I mean, strangely enough, it was, uh, um, I guess not really a Heideggerian or, um, I mean, I've always wanted to be a fiction writer. I, I just didn't think it was a realistic, uh, uh, um, job path. So for some reason I thought being a philosopher was, uh, actually a more viable, uh, viable <laughs> path. <laughs> um, but I had a, a very uh, sort of eclectic uh, uh, um, university career. I so did a literature, uh, languages and literature undergrad. Uh, I did a MA in theory and criticism. And then I went to um, Vanderbilt to do my uh, philosophy PhD. And uh, um, I uh, was writing a dissertation on fundamental ontology, believe it or not. Uh, um, but mixed in with Silarzian, Brandomian, uh, um, normativist uh, considerations. And I was very, very close to being completed, uh, to completing my draft anyways. Um, and I just, I'd always planned to do a chapter on, on neuroscience. I, I, and I had been reading neuroscience and, uh, uh, um, you know, in the months while I was pulling my dissertation to uh, together, and uh, um, um, as I started the chapter on neuroscience, it was the whole project just collapsed, and uh, it was a genuine existential crisis for me because if I can't, if I don't believe in it, I can't write about it, and uh, um, uh, I was, you know you know, pondering what to say to my wife, you know, what am I going to do? I start from scratch. Maybe I should go to a different program, you know. Uh, um, but I just lost all faith in, in uh, my project. And then by uh, um, total serendipity, uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, at Vanderbilt, um, Nick Smith, actually, uh, he... Uh, had given an old manuscript of mine to an old roommate of his who happened to be a um, literary agent in New York. 
And uh, um, right in the middle of this crisis, I, I, I got all these uh, uh, offers, three book deals, to, uh, to be a fiction writer. After all, so it was it was an escape hatch. It was uh, 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 it saved my life, <laughs> and uh, um, and obviously never gave up on the philosophy and never gave up on the insight, which destroyed my uh, my dissertation, and uh, um, has brought me to your attention I, I gather so yeah uh, interesting so so was it that you were I mean it sounds like what you're saying is you're working on fundamental ontology and then you start studying the neuroscience and you realize that the kind of question of asking what is fundamental has to address what the brain is doing and then you realize well that takes away the normativity and really any kind of interesting thing I could say about ontology is that sort of what happened yeah well I mean the big I mean the big insight was just uh, uh, um, uh, um, basically uh, realizing just how unbelievably capricious uh, um, human um, theoretical reflection was and uh, uh, um, understanding that a lot of these insights that I was pursuing were actually far better explained as being um, cognitive versions of visual illusions. And uh, um, that's what I'd actually was building. I was building a, a very, uh, 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 complex cognitive <laughs> uh, um, uh, version of a visual illusion. And uh, um, uh, I mean, that's the way I look at much of philosophy, especially in intentional philosophy now as, as, as being in almost in the same uh, business as uh, um, researchers into optical illusions. Uh, um, because I mean, it's just unbelievable the kinds of optical illusions that they're capable of creating now. Right. And uh, I think we've been at it in its cognitive guise for, you know, well, probably, uh, you know, millennia now, so. And so the key, I mean, so you're, you're really interested in consciousness and in your writing on consciousness, you, you kind of come to this, what you're saying, this, uh, this, this idea that most of what we call consciousness is an illusion uh, generated by a kind of bottleneck in the brain's inability to see itself in a sense. Um, and I mean, you say you're in a more of a eliminativist than regular eliminativists. So, yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if I could just start by asking you what it is that, so what, when you're talking about consciousness, what do you take yourself to be talking about? Um, I mean, the term, the term is, is, uh, um, uh, impossible to uh, nail down uh, um, between theorists. Uh, theorists I, I, I realize, um, but I mean, just whenever we refer to our experience, I mean, I think it's simply the uh, um, the simplest way. Whatever, whatever it, it is, whatever it, it is that we're talking about when we report experiences, and uh, um, uh, I think, I, I mean, I think that's enough. I think. Uh, um, that's as much as I need to make my case as to what consciousness likely is not, right. which is which is largely what my my position is. So um, I mean, the blind brain theory is a, a theory of the appearance of consciousness. So it's uh, um, uh, uh, takes a look at you know the evolutionary ecological preconditions of human metacognition and just simply asks, right, how would, you know, uh, being like a human likely, you know, uh, uh, mistake itself when at last it finally turned to interrogate its own soul. And uh, um, so it's, it, it, it's, so, I, I'm, so, for instance, qualia limitivism. I, I mean, I, I agree with much of what Dennett has to say when it comes to uh, when it comes to qualia. I, I don't think uh, um, I, I think I could probably hammer out a much more elegant argument. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I'm uh, an eliminativist about experience, you know, as something ontologized, as as a thing. Um, uh, it, but I'm also and a limitivist when it comes to uh, even, you know, cognitive scientific staples as central as representation, right? So for instance, uh, I mean, I would argue that representation is 
not a thing, <laughs> not a thing out there in the world or whatever, but uh, it's actually uh, uh, much better understood as a powerful shorthand um, that we use to uh, um, understand systems like ourselves. So, I, I mean, that's uh, one of the reasons why I was asking is because sometimes you talk about the phenomenal, how do these things present phenomenally? Sometimes you talk about self-consciousness. And so it, it sounds like what you're saying now, though, is is sort of in the middle there, just, just experience. That's what it is really you're after when you target. So I'm wondering, like, where on the spectrum is self-consciousness? Is that an experience for you? Or how do I parse these different terms that you use? Yeah, well, I mean, self-consciousness, I, I mean, so I, I, I would, I, I would uh, um, like to know how, you know, the term self-consciousness is used just simply in everyday discourse, solving everyday interpersonal problems, right? I mean, we refer to our experiences all, all the time. And the, uh, um, those, those types of uses of, of those terms are, are the kinds of uses that, you know, your parents, you know, your, your, uh, um, uh, your wife's parents, you know, and their parents and their parents uh, um, uh, have used themselves. And, you know, in that context, um, the types of deliverances, whatever it is that's informing the reports, right, uh, um, it's actually quite powerful, a quite powerful way to, to solve issues, right? So the problem comes when the philosopher says, well, what do you mean by self-consciousness, right? What is phenomenal experience? Right when the philosopher asks uh, what these things are, that's where we inevitably run into problems because um, those questions, even though they're just imminently reasonable questions to ask, uh, don't actually come first <laughs> in the order of explanation. I mean, we first have to ask what the ecology of this, you know, uh, uh, um, questioning experience. Uh, consists in to really to really get a grip on uh, um, our ability to answer questions like what is self consciousness, what is phenomenality, and so on. Okay, so so you wouldn't agree with the kind of starting place that many philosophers start from the identification of consciousness as there being something that it's like for an agent. So that the having a first person point of view have, have their. Um, or these kind of innocuous things, you know, so when I see red, there's something that it's like for me to see red. What it's like is different than tasting chocolate or hearing a sound. Same is true when I reflect, you know, so so that often philosophers want to identify the thing they're trying to explain with this thing that Thomas Nagel introduced, but it's kind of widespread everywhere, you know, so, um, and, and, and even on a theory like yours, I wonder if you're going to end up saying, well, there's nothing that it's like to be human, or if you don't think that's a useful or helpful way of presenting the the, oh, uh, I, I just I mean, what I what I think is that the, the systems involved in in what it's uh, what it's like questions, right? Which which you know come up all the time in non theoretical contexts. I mean, all the time we say what it was like. Um, uh, those systems are dedicated to answering those kinds of practical questions, those kinds of practical problems, right? It's as soon as we take those systems, which are radically heuristic. Uh, um, uh, turning on incredibly specialized information, right? That that uh, uh, our ancestors evolved in order to solve, you know, pressing, you know, reproductively high impact problems that they faced in their cognitive ecologies. And so once we 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 take those systems and we ask those systems to solve a theoretical problem, such as what is redness for instance, or what is pain, um, we almost instantly trip into crash space. So we have, which is just to say we have these systems and they work for us in all these practical contexts, but we have no metacognitive awareness whatsoever of the scope of applicability of these systems, right? Let alone the types and kinds of information that they turn on and require in order to derive uh, um, you know, advantageous uh, solutions to whatever the practical problem happens to be. We have no inkling of any of that. So right. when we take these questions, you know, bump them up to the theoretical level and say, what is redness? 
I mean, what we're doing is we're, we're using a very, very specific set of tools adopted to to uh, uh, ultimately limited set of uh, uh, problem ecologies, as as the ecological rationalists would say, um, and asking you know questions you just simply couldn't hope to uh, give anything but deceptive answers to. And so since we're blind to the apparatus, <laughs> it just feels like the apparatus is omni-applicable. And it's like, why the hell can I ask that question? Um, uh, I, I mean, it rolls off my lips easily enough. Right. Right? And, uh, um, and my answer is that, well, there's nothing wrong with the question. It's just, you know, with every question, you have to, you know, ask yourself what it would take to answer that question. And when you take a hard look at the biology and the ecology of uh, uh, of these uh, issues, it becomes very very clear, I think, that uh, um, we shouldn't expect much <laughs> in the way of answers, and we should we should expect to be, you know, spoofed and confounded and and uh, uh, um, troubled in all the ways philosophy shouts, as far as I'm concerned. Right? I mean, conundrums. You know, I mean, even even the way you know philosophical schools will turn on you know systematic or quasi systematic sets of insights um, fits the kind of pattern of heuristic breakdown that you might expect from from the misapplication of you know uh, specific practical problem solving uh, practical practical problem solvers to uh, big theoretical questions. Yeah, yeah, so does that make sense? Yeah. I, it does, but I, I'm I'm trying to ask about maybe one step back um, sure. before we talk about theorizing, and I and want to get to that. But just from the at the common sense level, pre theoretically, yeah, is, is there something that it's like to see red? Do you think? I mean, or no? Um, is that, is that merely an appearance that's not real? Or I mean, I'm trying to get a clip. How's that? How's that a question? I mean, because I, I, um, you're asking it in general. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's something. It, it, there's something it's like to see red at, uh, at a concert with you know a red laser show and stuff like that. There's something like seeing red when you're smelling roses, you know, um, that you're you're handing to your wife. Um, there's something like uh, uh, it, uh, to uh, uh, see red when you're on the floor and you grasp a bleeding wound. Right. I mean. Uh, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> but is there something like to see red abstracted from all those contexts? And I was like, no, I, I mean, why, how? <laughs> how could human beings have evolved the ability to, to uh, um, uh, you know, basically answer a question like that, you know, given just how limited in practical our, our metacognitive resources seem to be. I mean, to me, it seems that obviously they have to be, right, from a biological standpoint. I mean, there's just so much brain, <laughs> it, most complicated mechanism we know, and we have to somehow be able to report <laughs> part of that complexity to uh, our fellows. And, uh, uh, you know, you're on the ground, you're bleeding, or you feel you're down, it hurts, you feel liquid, you know, you peer at it and you say, think it's blood <laughs> i think i see red <laughs> you know right yeah, so, I, mean, I mean let's let's <laughs> focus on the less gruesome example maybe the <laughs> <laughs> i'm just trying to i'm trying to give practical context <laughs> no i yeah hopefully the <clears throat> bleeding is not too practical but so when you are in that context like that very situation and you say you know i feel the liquid i see the color um are you ultimately going to be a limitivist about those practical particulars? Because I take it someone like Dennett, he he says, yeah, you you merely think that you see the color. It's it's oh, not no. really something that's a part of your conscious experience. Um, and that's that's a kind of a limitivism. I'm wondering if you subscribe to or not. That was what was clear to me when I was reading your stuff. Is so ultimately, I think that you you argue that there's a lot of uh, an illusion going on here, a kind of trick. But still, the trick appears real, and that's what a theory of consciousness is about. It's about the way the things appear. 
So it ultimately, it sounded to me like you're not really an eliminativist, but really sort of a kind of consciousness is not what you think it is type of person. And I'm, I'm wondering where I've gone, if, I, if that's not an accurate description of your view. I'm, I'm an eliminativist uh, uh, um, uh, about uh, um, the appearance of consciousness to, to uh, uh, um, reflection. Um, I don't read Dennett that way, by the way. I, I mean, Dennett, you know, for Dennett, I mean, the problem, it isn't that you don't have these experiences, right? It's just that there's no such thing as qualia. Like, there's just, there's no such thing as this uh, uh, natural kind, right, that uh, uh, um, can be isolated and analyzed, right? I mean, um, in, in specialized uh, theoretical contexts, right? I mean, I mean, the way I understand Dennett, I mean, he'd be, he is not an eliminativist about you know seeing blood on your leg or and and is it red or is it not red, uh, um, but he is an eliminativist about you know these uh, posits that uh, um, uh, intuition just seems to so obviously present to reflection, and uh, um, that's the kind of eliminativism that uh, that uh, that I share that I share with them. Um, so, so just to uh, interrupt you for a second, if I can. So what you're saying is that the thing you're an eliminativist about is a certain theoretically construed as a notion of consciousness, not consciousness itself. Exactly. So, I mean, so there is consciousness and, and, um, you know, I think there will be something. So I like, I mean, for, for me, uh, um, my theory, uh, um, Feels like it just sort of naturally fits with uh, 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 on the cognitive side, uh, you know, Bayesian uh, um, theories of uh, cognitive function, and, and on the consciousness side with uh, um, EMF type type theories, right? Uh, uh, I mean, but for me, that's just I don't need it, and it's so highly speculative that I like to just sort of you know set that to one side. So I think there is consciousness; human beings have it. Um, and it will be scientifically uh, um, examined, and it will, you know, uh, um, turn out to be nothing like what we feel it's like. Um, it'll, it'll, uh, like most scientific discoveries, will probably be alienating and radically decentering uh, um, when it comes to uh, human intuition. So, so I mean, that's a, that's the part I guess that's kind of hard for me to. I mean, obviously it's hard to wrap your head around it, but what, that's the part that I'm trying to, trying to really grasp here is that suppose that we have the neuroscience uh, sort of under our belt. And so when you see red, you know, we understand what happens at the receptors of the eye and the areas of V1, V2, V4, et cetera. Um, and then you say, okay, so now the experience of red, uh, which you might've thought as a simple, unanalyzable, ineffable sort of thing, You've come to learn more about it, but it, how is it, on your view, going to be radically different from the way we sort of commonsensically think about it? Because, well, let me just ask you that. How, in what way is it going to be different than the, than how we pre theoretically thought about it? I, I, I mean, I, I mean, the, I think it, it, I, I, so. I, I think I overgeneralized, right? But, but it will be radically different insofar as redness, this notion that there's uh, um, this thing that can be isolated as opposed to just simply correlating the, the, uh, uh, um, the uh, um, deliverances of you know, two radically different cognitive systems, right? One which is uh, um, ad hoc, built to answer uh, questions on the fly that have life and death consequences in pre-technological environments, right? And the latter, which is absolutely immersed in, in technology and in technological uh, instrumentation and uh, dedicated to uh, sourcing things uh, um, in uh, uh, larger natural systems, right? Um, so, you know, if you, know, you have experience read and if we can, if we can say, okay, well, we have this experience and, and we can pin it to these natural systems and then we can track the way in which we use our reports, you know, vis-a-vis -vis practical contexts every day, right? Then, yeah, sure, if, you know, okay, if, if, 
if that's what you want to call red, I'm, I'm fine with that, right? But if you say, uh, say something like uh, Tom Clarkwood or, or uh, um, anyone uh, who, who thinks there's something super physical going on, right, then, I don't know, <laughs> I, I'm afraid you're, you're chasing ghosts, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you're not. Well, what uh, do you mean by that, chasing ghosts? I mean, because, I mean, you know, not that it matters, but my cards on the table, I'm pretty much a physicalist. Mm -hmm. yeah. of an old school type like I'm sort of an identity theorist uh, at least yeah. I don't see any reason not to be one so I expect um, the experience of red to be identical with some actual processing in the brain uh, and I don't think that's a limit of this I think it's just finding out the nature of the thing which I knew about from the inside from from the outside so so that I, I, I don't really see what being eliminated except for I, what you said earlier, which I can agree with, which is that there's a certain way of characterizing that, um, which maybe philosophers have tended to do as being, you know, indubitable and simple or something like that. That's going to have to fall probably. But as far as the experience itself, I, I'm not sure in what sense we're eliminating it. Yeah. Well, see, I'm not a, I'm not a, an identity theorist, right? So, I, I mean, so what I want to say is that the, your report of red. Right, and your the reports that you make, that that's that actually belongs to, uh, um, and can only only be understood in the context of uh, a, a, of uh, a larger cognitive ecology, and that it, um, you know to actually take that and say, oh, it belongs to here in the brain, or this is where it arises into br in the brain, to, to source it that way is to misconstrue the relationship between the two ecologies, right? Because that's what we're talking about. Um, in my view, you know, you have a shallow ecological relationship with your own physiology. And thanks to science, you have a, a, a deep ecological, you know, one, uh, 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 to to your own physiology and that really uh, it's not that you shouldn't expect that there's going to be connections you know um, between those two ecologies they're going to be connected in countless different ways it's just to say that those connections aren't going to be one-to-one -one. <laughs> in um, they're likely going to be surprising and like everything else in biology they're going to be um, in some cases unbelievable or whack to uh, uh, hard to swallow via common sense, right? Um, but they're not going to be one to one. There's not going to be uh, uh, any way in which we any agreeable any way com consensus commanding way to um, actually take the deliverances of these two systems: the shallow ecological system and the deep ecological system, and and uh, um, match match them up in a simple uh, simple manner it's going to be very very complicated like everything else you know, yeah I I, I, I can and, see and, that. and so so saying you know that every experience is in some way shape or form the product of the brain is one thing right but saying that you know every single experience um, can actually be nailed down to these specific neural processes, um, maybe, maybe not, right? In some cases, yes, but in other cases, obviously, no. Just simply because it all depends on, right, the actual natural facts pertaining to, you know, the shallow information ecology that you know we, you know, call uh, uh, um, our inner life or what have you, right? And those, those. Like I say, that, um, sometimes they're going to match up in some strange way, and sometimes they're not going to match up in any way that we can that we can readily fathom. So, so does that, that make like, it more clear? It does make it more clear. I, I still I'm not sure in what sense we're eliminating anything, uh, especially you know. Uh, so if we want to talk about the the color red, just talk about the an intentional state like belief, which you say is going to be uh, more than likely eliminated. So, and you say you don't even like Dennett's version of this, where you know it's. Um, well, yeah, I think that's not. Well, Dennett has I mean, a low. Re I I would argue Dennett has a low re a low resolution uh, um, version uh, of what's going on, but I mean Dennett. I mean Dennett, and all. I mean most people accuse Dennett of wanting to have things both ways, right? Because it, uh, um, superficially he does, right? But he's he's 
basically making the same point I am, right? I mean, it's like, it, I mean, he's saying there's nothing illusion, uh, 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 there's no illusion when you talk about your pain, there's no illusion when you talk about, you know, bread, there's no illusion, you know, I mean, you're talking about real things that are happening to you in, in a real world, right? The illusion, the illusions arise when we attempt, when we attempt to, you know, basically analyze, theoretically analyze, basically take the metacognitive tools we've we've received, which are very, very specific, very, very uh, uh, limited, constrained, and apply them to answer, you know, nature type questions. What's the nature of red, for instance? Um, just so, I mean, that's what gets eliminated is the uh, uh, um, you know the kinds of uh, uh, posits, the kinds of uh, uh, um, definitions that fall out of those misapplications of what are ultimately very very parochial uh, uh, um, practice grounded tools, right? Right. Oh, I see. So, so your your claim is more about what happens when we introspect, and then try to give a theory of what we find in in our introspection. It's not, well, not just introspection. It's it's when we actually try to solve, uh, and come up with general answers, right? Using using uh, specific tools. When we actually we try to ask nature of type questions, right? Sometimes introspection is involved in that, right? But it's uh, um, just reflection, you know, absent uh, 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 um, any sort of uh, uh, scientific scaffolding. Uh, especially is is doomed to you know lead you down any number of uh, of paths. I see. Okay. Yeah. That that makes it clearer. I think uh, what you were saying before. Yeah. Um, so so a, a lot a lot of what's come up already is based on information. So it seems like information plays kind of a crucial role yeah. in a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. And you and you've talked about in some of your other work the, that is the 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 integration of information, which is really important, and even sort of aligned yourself with people like Tononi and um, yeah. and their their kind of views on this, uh, and even Edelman's uh, dynamic core. Yeah. Obviously. yeah, I mean uh, Tononi, I liked Tononi initially, anyways, so, um, just because it was compatible with my position, right? Um, no, I agree with them. I think whatever consciousness, you know, whatever when consciousness is understood as a as a natural phenomenon, um, that's the big uh, desideratum that we want from from uh, uh, um, that explanation, right? I mean, that's what we want to really understand is uh, how how is it all this stuff ends up being here, <laughs> you know, part of this, whatever, right. whatever the hell this turns out to be. And uh, um, I mean, that seems to be something that's crucial to any satisfying account of, of consciousness. I agree with them that far, yeah. And, and then what you add, of course, is this idea of the the kind of open and closed nature. You know, so it, so on your view, there's a there's a system which is going to be generating consciousness, responsible for it. You call it the recursive system. Um, this thing is open to all the information which is coming through, but closed in another sense as well. And I, it, so it's integrating things off stage, so to speak. But what shows up is is very limited, and that's something I think that's very very different from maybe the way that Tononi and those guys want to present their, their view. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, uh, um, I mean, as far as it, it's been a long time since I've read any Tononi, um, uh, but as far as I recall, I mean, he's an identity theorist as well. Right. I mean, he, he wants to sort of nail the, nail down this interface. Right. Um, but, but he's um, not, well, just, uh, he's not an identity theorist in the sense that I was using the term, which identity with the brain, um, his identity is identity with integrated information. With integrated uh, information, yeah. Which is, he thinks, something separate over and above, actually not reducible to simply brain. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. I, I, um, but you're, so you'd be against any kind of identity claim, it sounds like what you're saying, no matter no, what you yeah, yeah. No, not any kind. I, I, I mean, I just don't think that the, it, it'll be uh, um, the relationship between what it is we report and, and uh, what it is we discover, uh, um, you know, in terms of neurophysiology, is ever going to be a simple one, just simply because of uh, um, the apparatus <laughs> we, that uh, that we're stranded with when it comes to the latter. So, um, I, I, you see, this notion of uh, heuristic misapplication. I mean, that's I mean, that's what's central central to to my view. Um, 
in understanding just what it means to suffer from what I call metacognitive neglect. So take something like um, the, in quantum physics, for instance, the, the distinction uh, between theories that try to under, uh, explain quantum weirdness as being an intrinsic ontological feature of the quantum realm, right, versus uh, um, attempts to explain it uh, as being basically an epistemic feature of our limited ability to engage the microscopic, right? Um, why should that be a problem? I mean, why can't we just simply scratch our head and say, you know, solve that? Right. I mean, it seems to be such a strange, strange problem to just accept. Oh, OK, well, is it an artifact of uh, of our limitations or is it actually a property of the world over and above what we make of it? Um, if you think about it, that's a very, very curious predicament for a cognitive being to find itself in, right? And it really, I think, uh, uh, concretizes the degree to which we're hobbled by neglect. I mean, we are so blind to our, the constitutive and, and, and in many respects, circumstantial dimensions of our own cognitive processes that we often find ourselves stymied by questions involving, you know, whether or not a property is independent of us or whether a property is actually uh, um, part and parcel of the circuit we form with nature. Um, once you sort of you wrap your head on that blindness that we have, <laughs> that inability to distinguish, then you can really, I think, see um, uh, uh, how neglect looms large over every question you encounter in philosophy of mind insofar as so many questions in philosophy of mind actually turn on on that very issue right to what degree are we foisting this on you know uh, reality and to what degree is it just simply reality jumping out at us and when you when you take that issue that problem of metacognitive neglect you know uh, uh, you go meta <laughs> to the question of meta metacognitive neglect, <laughs> right? <laughs> and suddenly, I, I would argue all kinds of things suddenly uh, um, start becoming very, very clear. I mean, even the subject object dichotomy, right? I mean, if we're constitutively blind to the constitutive uh, um, axis of cognition, right, then really we have no choice but to radically schematize. Uh, um, our relationship, right, to our world, and and subject-object dichotomy is uh, a, um, a very very uh, uh, simplistic <laughs> way to conceive of that uh, uh, con that relationship that we have with the world, and and then all of a sudden, you know, this whole the whole question of something being out there as opposed to something being in here, you can see that as a heuristic tool. Right. And then the whole question of the applicability of that tool arises. And because it is radically heuristic, you would expect it to have a limited domain of applicability. So all of a sudden you can start looking at, you know, um, all the ways in which philosophy agonizes over this issue as most likely being a problem of application. Right. Where we have this schema for dealing with our own metacognitive neglect um, uh, uh, and yet solving metacognitive problems, certain metacognitive problems regardless. No, no, it's in your head. It's not in the world, right? Problem solved. Um, uh, if it turns out in fact that you're correct. Um, suddenly you see a huge uh, swaths of philosophy actually you know, going through the the uh, uh, problems they they do as being an artifact of a systematic misapplication of what's uh, a uh, very you know uh, specific heuristic scheme to fundamental questions of what is. You know? So uh, I mean it. That's what this is. What makes it so difficult to express my view and to it, 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 to uh, get people to. 
wrap their heads around it is the fact that we're always, I'm always, everyone is always sort of trapped with these tools that uh, um, allow us to do powerful things in certain circumstances without any sort of awareness of the limits of those tools. <laughs> and, you know, to such an extent that it feels perfectly intuitive to apply those tools in ways in which they just simply have no hope of solving problems, right? Right. Wittgenstein, for instance, you know, I mean, um, uh, uh, or, or normativism in general, you know, I, I mean, if it, intentional cognition is a practical, it belongs to uh, a, a, a set of systems that we evolved to uh, solve one another um, uh, in lieu of any, you know, natural scientific information, right? A way to actually avoid having to cognize each other's brains or physiology to, to solve uh, for brains and for physiology, um, then why the hell should we think that those systems <laughs> actually have any, have any hope of solving, you know, themselves, right? Why should we think normative cognition can uh, uh, um, actually has theoretical application, right? right. It, That's not what it was evolved for. <laughs> it's not what it's not what it evolved for. It, it evolved to actually systematically neglect neglect nature's right. and solve nature's, regardless, right? And uh, if that's the case, then asking those systems to solve for nature's is bound to lead to you know. Uh, 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 theoretical miasma. And so when you look at, you know, normativism, I mean, you know, it's supposed to be a big break from the philosophical tradition. And yet for some strange reason, <laughs> it suffers all the same problems of underdetermination that that philosophical tradition uh, uh, um, suffers as well. So and when it comes to the question of experience and, and phenomenality, I'm saying the same thing with with respect to uh, metacognition and reflecting on these on these questions and on these issues, right? So they just don't have the applicability that we think that we think they do. And so, I mean, you mentioned sellers earlier. I'm wondering. So, some people who work in this area would say, "Look, what we want to do is come up with a theory that best accounts for." Uh, the data that we have, the, the data that people th things that people say, and what they can do in the labs, and so forth and so on, and 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 uh, so some people might think, well, look, you know, the experience of red, the the a belief that you have, they're not the sort of thing that you're going to find um, uh, in introspection, and you know, maybe that's a bad way of, or or even on reflection or whatever, but they're like theoretical posits, like electrons. So mm -hmm. that we posit these things as um, as a way to explain a lot of this other behavior. And so to take a simple example, you know, when people um, see apples, they say that they're red or whatever or green. And then you put them in a lab, you can show the, the same picture subliminally. People say they don't see something, but then they're able to discriminate um, the color uh, unconsciously and it primes them for various things. And so we say, well, look, there must be some kind of mental state by which they're representing the redness of the of the apple in both cases. And so then we're off and running, sort of po populating the mental with these theoretical posits. And of course they could be refined or eliminated or added to, but why isn't that kind of approach, or why do you think it, it, that sort of approach isn't uh, gonna work as a way of avoiding the kind of problem that you're pointing out? Well, I mean, I think, you know, so when we operationalize uh, um, things like intentional or phenomenal posits, uh, um, yeah, I think it's going to work in all, all kinds of potential uh, um, uh, contexts, right? I mean, um, they just won't generalize the way we want them to. And surprise, surprise, right? I mean, you look at, uh, um, you know, men the mental and you look at, you know, various types of, you uh, um, uh, psychological theories uh, that actually turn on mental representations, and you know, you, you find this difficulty of sort of actually taking it out of that specific research context. It just doesn't seem to travel, right? The way natural scientific uh, posits seem seem to travel, 
Like, what, um, what, what exactly do you have in mind when you say that they don't travel? Like, I mean, I know what you mean by that, but what specific thing doesn't travel? Oh, I, I mean, uh, um, I, I like take the debate over beliefs, for instance, right? I mean, uh, um, uh, beliefs uh, um, in psychological theories that that uh, uh, um, turn on beliefs as posits, uh, um, you know, really seem to solve all kinds of problems in all kinds of specific uh, um, contexts, right? Um, uh, psychological contexts. But as soon as you as soon as you start asking the question, well, where do you find a belief in the brain? Where uh, um, what uh, is uh, the you know the the uh, um, etiology of you know uh, a given belief? Um, as soon as you start asking those kinds of questions, then all of a sudden the mysteries crop up everywhere, and uh, um, you know the game of uh, of uh, you know trying to define uh, um, our explananda in ways in which you know fit our theories begins, right? And it just uh, becomes very very quickly uh, evident that there's no way of actually resolving these these debates just simply because we can't actually formulate our explananda in any way that compels consensus right so you have all these so you have you just cannot so beliefs talking beliefs does a lot of practical work everyday practical work there's no doubt about that um when you uh theorize it you can you can do a certain amount of theoretical work with beliefs you know without uh, uh tripping over your own shoelaces um, uh, uh, you can actually use the term in clinical contexts to great effect, right? And, and uh, uh, um, change people's lives, you know? So it's, it has all kinds of therapeutic benefits, right? But when, as soon as we attempt to try to, uh, try to map it into, you know, the nature of, you know, the, the meat, the high dimensional, right? The, as I like to call the physical, right? Um, all of a sudden, we're we're stymied. We're left we're left scratching our heads. And yeah. So so I I wonder. I mean, I, I guess I would personally object to that. But I wonder why you, having said that, aren't more of like a Denetian, because I think that's exactly his argument, isn't it? That uh, the things are so useful, they're not they're not physically in the brain, um, but they're the intentional stance is something that we can't ever get rid of exactly because of its usefulness. And so we posit these things to capture patterns in the behavior of these uh, of the organisms around us. But when we go into the brain, we take a different stance. That's the, the design stance. Um, and we're not going to find anything like beliefs in there. We're just going to find neurons and, and their connections and, and stuff like that. But that doesn't suggest that beliefs on his view aren't just aren't real. It just means that they're they're at a different level of explanation or something like that, capturing patterns of behavior rather than uh, something instantiated in the brain. Yeah, I, I mean, so Dennett, Dennett um, he wants to uh, uh, basically have a big tent ontology and actually allow um, all these things, uh, all these terms to be, uh, to be uh, uh, equal, equal partners in the, the grand endeavor of uh, scientifically understanding the human soul. Um, unless it's Quelia, of course. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but, but, I, but I, uh, um, I mean, I mean, for me, I, you know, you know, an intentional stance for me is uh, sort of uh, I view it as kind of like a last gasp of traditional philosophizing, right? The intentional stance is itself a theoretical uh, uh, dividend of applying intentional cognition to the the question of intentionality. Right, um, applying this hyper heuristic system uh, um, to solve a very very general problem, and um, even though the intentional stance, physical stance, design stance, even though they actually you know capture the specificity of uh, uh, of you know certain uh, low resolution uh, low resolution understandings of uh, uh, of uh, the ways in which you know. Um, intentional cognition is heuristic, right? Um, they don't allow you to go any further than that. They, that's basically where it stops, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, I mean, his latest book is a perfect example. I mean, he's trying to understand, he's trying to explain comprehension. And you know, if you've been reading Dennett all through, it's the intentional stance is everywhere. And then when it comes to explaining things, and then when it comes to comprehension, 
it disappears, right? Because ultimately that's what he's trying to explain, the intentional stance, right? So his primary explanatory tool, simply no avail uh, um, when it comes to actually explaining the difference between comprehension and competence, the way he attempts to do in, um, except, uh, from bacteria uh, or from bacteria to Bach and back. Um, <clears throat> My, my position is just to do away with things like the intentional stance. I mean, we're not talking about intentional stances. I mean, we're talking about systems that humans evolved, right, to, to track each other and to track themselves and to solve a variety of practical, practical problems. Um, and those are, you know, they're natural, right? I mean, we're going to be able to pick them apart, reverse engineer them, right, and, and fit them into the big synthetic picture of biology um, at some point. Uh, um, you don't need intentional stances. It's, I mean, that just simply introduces yet another, you know, uh, a homunculus into uh, our, uh, our our explanatory apparatus. Um, but doesn't your own? I mean, so really? if if the if you take your own view at face value, and you so you have the system that's informationally blind in in a real deep sense, um, then explaining how the system is tricked to the system itself isn't going to allow it to change its output that's sort of the idea of its encapsulation so that you can coming to know all this stuff uh, about you know the the way the tricks are performed it, it's not going to change the way the consciousness system generates the illusion that it generates right okay. so okay. in that sense you can't you can't eliminate I mean, it's always going to just fall back into the way it normally characterizes things, uh, stuff out there, stuff in here, beliefs, qualia, or, yeah. or, right? Oh, I, I mean, if you ask these questions, it, it, I mean, it's the same with optical illusions, right? I mean, as right. soon as you understand that it's an optical illusion, the illusion doesn't go away, right? I mean, all you can say is that, oh, okay, well, that, that's just my eyes screwing with me, right? And, right. and move on. You know, um, the problem the problem we have is that it, uh, in terms of just simply bandwidth or metacognitive bandwidth doesn't come anywhere close to the bandwidth that we enjoy with via visual cognition. You know, so in visual cognition, you know, we encounter an anomaly and it's like, whoa, yeah, that's a that's an anomaly, right? Right. Um, in in reflection, we encounter anomalies all the time, and and this is interesting because you know. I mean, philosophy <laughs> is generally held in ill repute, um, in you know, <laughs> amongst the folk, right? And, and uh, um, in this sense, the folk I think are, uh, might actually have the have the best of it, right? Because really, I mean, when you ask, and I do this, I ask people what you know what they think of philosophy, and they just think it's basically people, you know, um, asking questions that have no answers. Right and really have no sort of practical use whatsoever, anyways. And it's interesting to me because I mean that just translates so seamlessly into what I'm telling you, which is, which is that we have these these very very specific systems, right, that consume very very specific information, that that we evolved to uh, uh, solve ancestral uh, cognitive ecologies, and and that um, when as soon as we venture to ask these questions. Right, we're going to run afoul these things. So, I mean, my paper on alien philosophy was uh, basically an attempt to kind of recontextualize these debates, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, alien species, the the, the convergence, and uh, uh, um, just to show how you you know you really can, I think, make a plausible argument that you know aliens with a convergent cognitive biology would actually suffer a lot of the same kinds of uh, uh, problems we seem to suffer when it comes to uh, answering the questions uh, of their own soul. For right, and, but but and I I mean I'll just I agree for the sake of our discussion here. But my question was uh, about you know how we cognitize how, how we how we address the other people around us. Um, is there ever going to be any better way of talking about you than saying you believe X or are you ever going to write a better fiction novel by getting rid of beliefs or mental states? Or, I mean, the tiger wants to eat you is a good way to characterize what's going on with the tiger when he's attacking you. That's not ever going to change no matter how much you learn about the brain. That so was kind of the point I was making. Yeah. Oh, and this feeds right into uh, um, 
the semantic apocalypse stuff, right? The the social consequences uh, of uh, basically being these these creatures suffering the, suffering um, uh, metacognitive myopia the way we do. It, um, uh, you know, I mean, whenever same way you know we uh, uh, um, uh, see uh, um, you know triangles and squares bickering in the Hyder Simmel illusion, right? Um, you know, um, just incredibly low amount of information, right? Yet cueing these incredibly complicated cognitive responses, right? Right, and we do. I mean, you can look at it and try to say, okay, that you know that triangle isn't arguing with her father square right i mean uh <laughs> but but still in the first instance that's what you see um yeah we are are basically doomed to run afoul these uh these these uh, types of illusions i mean they're just simply part of our uh, uh, our uh, cognitive inheritance right and um but that doesn't mean science um you know, can't just simply put a sign up <laughs> and say, you know, where if you go there, right? And yeah. uh, um, point us in other directions. And that's not to say that that uh, there isn't um, all kinds of ways in which, you know, we uh, um, suffer, you know, genuine problems that, that uh, um, could be hacked more effectively actually knowing you know what the actual interrelationships between our shallow metacognitive ecology and our, our, our deep ecology uh, uh, um, are so so yeah but I, I guess that's the way i was reading dennett was that uh that the, the the intentional stance is not a not the right level of not the level of explanation but the level of practical applicability so that according to him, look at just, if you don't look at another person and see them as wanting something, believing something, then you're just missing out on something which is important. And knowing that, you know, in the brain, none of that is really happening is interesting, but it doesn't change how extraordinarily useful taking this approach to other persons is. And so that at that, in that level, not the level of trying to understand what's happening, the nature of things, but just in, getting around the world. It doesn't seem like we're going to ever be able to do much better than that, given the way we're built. And That's, that seems to be a consequence of your view as well. It, it's a consequence of my view, except I just don't need the uh, intentional stance. I don't need intentional systems theory to, to talk about it, right? I mean, uh, um, that's a distraction. And, uh, and To talk about other people you do, though. No, no, I don't take the intentional stance toward anyone. Neither do you. No one does, right? I mean, I mean, uh, um, that's that's uh, uh, um, basically uh, um, yet one more way of uh, of oversimplifying uh, um, what's actually going on, right? And ultimately covering over the what I think will ultimately be the the real explanation, which is just simply, you know. So, you know, we have this ability to cognize sources in our environments, you know, and, and uh, um, science has given us uh, um, the tools we need to extend that ability, right, to, to actually, you know, source model things in, in our environment and to uh, uh, develop uh, almost unimaginably uh, uh, powerful complex ways uh, of uh, engaging in trans transforming our, our environment. Um, these low resolution systems, right, like intentional cognition, um, are, they're stuck at the level of correlations, right? They can't source things, right? All, all they can do is give us some sort of predictive uh, 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 um, uh, wedge that we can use to, to you know, manipulate those systems. Um, uh, uh, you know, and communicate these systems. We can do all kinds of things, but but we actually can't. I can't look at you and understand what your brain's doing, right? But I can look at you and say, okay, he's got a question. There's something I'm not answering, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, <laughs> and I can make all kinds of uh, of uh, um, powerful and perhaps correct inferences uh, uh, regarding your state of mind or or what it is, whatever it is your brain's up to, and how it actually pertains to, you know, whatever access I have, very, as limited as, as it is, 
to our, our interaction right now. Um, and you are stuck there <laughs> and we're stuck with those tools. And that's what I think, you know, that's what I think the it is the big danger for the future is the fact that we are stuck with these incredibly low resolution tools. In the same way, the Hyder Simmel uh, illusion so easily hacks intentional cognition, tricks it into in, into uh, um, seeing you know uh, wiggling squares and and uh, triangles as a soap opera. Uh, um, we are trapped. Right within within the circuit uh, of you know our social cognitive and metacognitive capacities, and uh, um, the the fact that they are so easily cued out of school, so easily misapplied, right, means that as our <laughs> knowledge of our deep information environment becomes more and more complete, our ability to spoof and uh, cheat. Our, uh, um, these systems becomes greater and greater, which means that the, their reliability, right, their functionality, right, becomes less and less reliable. So uh, um, there's a, a powerful, uh, I think, uh, uh, um, social uh, predictive component to uh, uh, the theory I'm offering you as well, right? Theory doesn't simply say, why it's hard for you to um, understand questions of uh, of redness, right? It also explains why <laughs> that difficulty that you have explaining that question renders you more susceptible to, uh, um, say, uh, uh, Facebook algorithms, for instance. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I, I mean, uh, one of the things this one of the things. I was, I've always been a nomad philosophically. I mean, I've gone through so many different positions and uh, um, this, uh, never in my life have I actually stuck with one position as long as I have now. And it, and it, it causes me anxiety sometimes. But the thing, the, the, the reason I have a hard time getting out of, you know, heuristic neglect theory, blind brain theory, it is the fact that, I mean, you would expect a general theory of cognition to actually be able to say something uh, um, uh, significant about all the varieties of cognition that we encounter in the course in the course of uh, human life, and it, it really, you know, so it's a limitist insofar as you can look at posits like belief, um, posits like redness, which I think is a posit. Uh, um, you can uh, uh, say all those things have nothing to do <laughs> with what's going on in the high dimensional world, right? Um, uh, and at the same time, you can explain why uh, um, we seem to be living through this present age uh, of uh, growing confusion, right? Why the plunging cost of reality is proving to be such a, a, a horrible, horrible social dysfunction. You know, why it is uh, AI, for instance, is, is something we should be terrified, um, even in the form of the chatbot, <laughs> let alone super intelligence, right? Like who gives a damn about super intelligence? I don't think we have a hope of making it to that point, right? Because it's the AIs that uh, um, have been designed, right? Uh, uh, um, to actually play off of our sociocognitive cues that uh, um, are... Uh, uh, yeah, you just need bots on Facebook posting stuff about Russia and we're done. <laughs> You're done. And, and they're set to flood our, our cognitive ecologies. Right. Um, that, that, I mean, that's so, I wondered to the, the, so to go, if you don't mind asking a little bit about some territory explored by the book Neuropath, yeah. which was sort of, try, I, I guess part of the point of what you were doing there was seeing how we could unravel or get out of what it would look like to sort of step outside of a lot of some of the box that is, we're boxed into by our cognitive systems. Yeah. Um, so the whole idea of a neural path with just someone, you know, whose had brains been tinkered with so that some of these systems are disabled, no empathy, you know, you know um, uh, soup up the rationality, et cetera. And that's a pretty depressing view that you get as a result. Um, and I wonder if that is your general view about, you know, 
uh, the way things will go? Or is there a, a chance that we could augment some of these systems to, to make it better, to, to allow more information in and as opposed to less? So I'm wondering exactly what your view about you know, uh, transhumanism and, and these kinds of views are. Yeah, I mean, so this the argument I'm making is kind of uh, it, it is uh, I guess what you would call a wisdom of uh, nature argument in, in transhumanist circles, where um, basically what we're doing is we're undoing systems that are interconnected with with one another in in such a way that uh, um, simply by tinkering with them, we're we're compromising the uh, uh, our cognitive ecology as a whole, and. Uh, um, the big, I think the, the, the real counter argument to that is uh, um, one uh, given by um, uh, Alan Buchanan in uh, Better Than Human, for instance, yeah. um, where you know, he just says, well, that misunderstands um, the, the role that connectedness, connectedness actually plays in um, ecology. So there's a high degree of modularity and that you know every ecology that you see you know is a survivor of multiple collapses right either in whole or part right which is why ecologies leap up again and uh um so he would argue that uh enhancing ourselves is something we almost have to do in order to keep up with the transformations of our cognitive ecologies right and that if something goes wrong we can fix it <laughs> And that's that's the great thing about enhancement, but but the problem is um, that you know you and I, I, I mean, are the product of, uh, of of you know hundreds of millions of years of uh, evolving right to be able to have this interaction right now, and you know as our ecologies change right. So I'm trying not to be too long winded here, but. Oh, as our no ability, <laughs> well, I, I mean, like just take, uh, I mean, just take um, the internet. You know, the way in which you know people who had radical views just even a few years ago, if they wanted to talk about their radical views, they had to talk to their neighbor, to their brother, to their friends, and uh, uh, odds are, they're not going to have the same radical views, right? right? So that that radical view will be tamped down, right? So you have some notion, whites are the best on the planet, right? Uh, um, and then you talk to your neighbors and you're like, ah, pretty self-congratulatory dude. Uh, you know, uh, most of us <laughs> masturbate indoors, right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and problem solved, right? Now, that doesn't happen. Right, exactly. Now, yeah. it just Google um, are uh, Muslims dangerous and count. <laughs> how many pages you have to go through before you actually get anything remotely close to uh, uh, you know a, a well reasoned skeptical response to those types to that question or those types of questions uh, in general? Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was the original question again? Uh, well, is there any hope for us to oh, yeah, modify ourselves in such a way that we can yeah. better ourselves as opposed to worsen ourselves? So, so Alan Buchanan um, would suggest something. Uh, uh, I'm putting words in his mouth here, um, but he would say something like, "Well, you know, okay, that's a problem, but that's a problem that can be fixed, right? right. Because we can make ourselves more uh, discriminatory when it comes to these types of issues by enhancing ourselves, right? So we could have like uh, uh, some sort of uh, onboard uh, bullshit detector or, or what have you, you know, but but." The question then it becomes, okay, you have a bullshit detector and I don't, right? Right. Um, <laughs> okay, all of a sudden it's like, well, bullshit detector, really? It just makes you sound like you're more full of bullshit than you've ever been. <laughs> you're like, well, no, no, I got a bullshit detector and I detected if it was bullshit, right? I, I, you get the gist. Yeah. The problem is, is as soon as we start augmenting ourselves, especially if we do it in a piecemeal way that's you know, basically determined by, you know, uh, uh, commercial contexts, right? The more the invariant background of the cognitive ecology that we rely on in order to have this, you know, uh, um, incredibly rarefied exchange, uh, um, 
uh, breaks breaks down. So it's just one of those situations where um, the more we enhance ourselves to attempt to get ahead of the problem, right, the more fundamentally we fuel the problem. And this is even more the case. I mean, right now we're just suffering from the problems that have come up with, uh, that have arisen because of tinkering with our external uh, cognitive environments. But I mean, as soon as we actually start rewriting our neurophysiology, right, automatically every, <laughs> you know, you have a different neurophysiology, that changes every cognitive ecology that you pass through, through the rest of your life, right? Um, and if everybody's doing it, and everybody's in an arms race of some kind. Yeah. You can see very how very quickly, uh, um, I call it the big splat sometimes, right? <laughs> how just the any kind of stable human cognitive ecology is, is bound to collapse. And our attempts to shore it up with more technology um, are just simply bound to exacerbate the problem. And I, and I don't see uh, any way out of it. I mean, like I, I think, and I don't see how the answers, the only solutions I can see are all just incredibly authoritarian, you know, neo-Ludite craziness. I mean, I just can't bring myself to endorse any of the possible solutions, right? Like, if I'm right, then what's going on with Trump and all this is continuous with, you know, the Anthropocene in general, right? It's simply part of the global ecological degradation of our planet as a whole. And, you know, the only way to undo ecological uh, degradation in our environments is to manage that, right? But now we're talking about managing souls. And, you know, there's just no way to talk about managing human souls, right, without actually, you know, throwing the whole enlightenment <laughs> for instance, out the window, right? Embracing some kind of crazy form of uh, a, a, of authoritarianism, you know. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I'm not sure. What I, I sometimes talking. wonder if this isn't the solution to the Fermi's paradox, right? I mean, right, uh, exactly. This is the great filter. <laughs> we saw yeah, the great filter. Time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, once you start tinkering, it goes down. I guess I'm more of an optimist here. I wonder, so, you know, so, some of the ideas that have been pointed to seem to me pretty good for reducing biases. You know, one, one idea was that if you could have an implant that detected, uh, that was connected to the internet and could give you kind of uh, um, vibrations depending on the crime rates of the neighborhood that you're in. So, you know, a pul like quicker pulse meaning you're in a higher crime rate area, the slower pulse meaning you're in a lower crime rate area, and pretty soon you, you come to just kind of sort of directly sense the crime, the statistics of the crime uh, of the area you're in. And this could, you know, lower people, you go into a predominantly black neighborhood, some people might be a little tense or afraid, but if they're getting this perception that the crime in that area is low, then they may uh, act very differently um, than they would if in, in, in without that kind of information. Um, you know, and that's kind of simple, a simple example, but you think even those kind of tinkering are going to have the drastic effects that you're talking about? I mean, well, first off, they wouldn't be universal, right? And uh, second off, they, they could actually give you the exact opposite responses that you want, right? I mean, it could be that, you know, where you live, uh, black neighborhoods are high crime neighborhoods, right? And and uh, so you're like, hey, every time I'm in a black neighborhood, I, I keep getting this high crime uh, alert, right? Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, the the connection between, you know, the uh, evening news, you know, if it, ble if it uh, bleeds, it leads. Yeah. Right? And uh, um, the kind of uh, um, phobias that, that seem to underwrite, you know, so many <laughs> policy outlooks in, in American life. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, you need to do some uh, heavy duty uh, research to, to be able to uh, uh, say anything definitive about it, but it, it seems to be a, a um, I don't know. It certainly seems to be a simple solution to think that humans evolved in contexts in communities of 150 to 250 people, right? Encountering uh, uh, violence and uh, 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 well, just say violence in those communities constitute a direct threat to oneself, right? Therefore, heightened sensitivity to those types of uh, uh, of acts, 
right, have def uh, a definite uh, survival value. Hence, we are hardwired, right, to process uh, um, information regarding uh, physical threat, right, against the backdrop of 150 people, right. right? When when you're when it's a backdrop of 150 million people. Right, it means that you're going to be acting on basically illusory, illusory uh, threat responses all the time, basically. And uh, you, I mean, you can, you know, then leverage that as you know being a condition for the uh, um, you know present hysteria regarding the scaravan, for instance. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, 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 Stephen Colbert, that's not me. <laughs> but uh, um. <laughs> Um, those kinds of you know heuristic misfires, which characterize so much of modern life, right? Um, Deidre Barrett calls it uh, calls them supernormal uh, uh, stimuli. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Sherry Turkle calls them uh, Darwinian buttons being pushed. Um, uh, you know, how do you know any given augmentation? Right, such as providing information as to what kinds of threats you have in your neighborhood, um, isn't simply going to have some sort of uh, uh, knock-on effect of systematically distorting, <laughs> right, what uh, uh, um, your behavioral response should be, and there's just no way to determine that in advance, right? So every single solution that you offer to, in this respect. Right is going to have a cloud of unintended consequences associated with it, and and uh, um, uh, you know it just seems to me that the more you pile this on, without you know the millennial filter of uh, of natural selection, right, the more unreliable our ancestral capacities are doomed are doomed to become. I just don't see how we can fix them <laughs> without making making the problem worse. Right. Yeah. You got, and the problem with natural selection is that it's deadly. <laughs> so, it doesn't give a damn, right? I mean, I, I mean, if this is the great filter, right, then uh, <laughs> this is, you know, natural selection just saying, oh, yeah, okay, turn yeah. the post shop. You guys, uh, <laughs> another peach dish in the, in the garbage bin, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so I want to just ask, well, I guess one final thing, which was, sort of more theoretically oriented about enhancement. Um, so does your theory of consciousness and the appearance of consciousness predict that if we could take the recursive system and in, and broaden its access to information to where it was open to all the information going on, then would consciousness disappear? Would it all, would, would it go away once the, if, if, if it had a perfect access to what was going on? Um, I, well, no, I, I mean, uh, I, um, it depends on what consciousness, you know, ultimately is, right? I mean, uh, um, well, I mean, on your view of it, um, I, I, well, like I say, I, I, uh, I think because you see EMFs being used in so many ingenious ways in so many different contexts uh, across nature, and simply because the brain is, you know, we know, uh, electrical biomechanical organism. I mean, I think I think uh, whatever, like once again, whatever this is, uh, EMF has uh, has something to do with that, and um, um, we're in, you know when we ask you know what it is via our metacognitive capacities, you know we um, are engaging consciousness, right? But what we call experience, all these other things, right? I mean, uh, uh, um, are are tethered to it, but are actually uh, um, uh, have far more to do with solving problems betwixt ourselves and whatnot. Uh, um, so yeah, could, so so the idea would be so right. so I would say that we would have radically attenuated uh, um, metacognitive relationships to um our ourselves and um there's no real limit i can see as to how attenuated those might possibly be a and that uh, um, what we presently enjoy is so granular right so low resolution right so uh um geared to ancestral practical problem solving that um our descendants 
you know, uh, um, in the future, should they actually survive whatever it is we're going through now, uh, um, would say, you know, yeah, they weren't really conscious. <laughs> I mean, but uh, on my view, they would be post-intentional, right? I mean, they wouldn't understand things the way we could and uh, the way the only way we can which which is uh via uh, um these these schema right these incredibly uh procrustean uh, um shorthands that we use uh so yeah so i, I mean yes and no <laughs> to the question i mean the, it, it, it's it, it, there's it's what comes after us, I don't think we can imagine it. And uh, um, once we understand ourselves all the way to the bottom, uh, um, I think that whatever humanity is now, it, it'll be unrecognizable to us. And I think we'd be horrified by uh, uh, um, what what comes after us. I think we'd be viscerally, viscerally horrified by it because I don't think it would be moral or, or recognizably moral or or you know emotional I'm not even sure it'd be recognizably rational although uh, although I know Eric would uh, Eric Schmitzgabel would argue uh, against that um, but yeah I think and this is one of the, the depressing points uh, most depressing things for me of this view is is that you know even if the technological optimists are right humanity is is fucked right i mean we're screwed, <laughs> we're screwed no matter what I, I mean we we cut our own throats right or we bootstrap ourselves out of existence and uh, uh um or anything recognizable as such and, uh, um and i just once again i just don't see any way any way past that right that i that i would want to endorse <laughs> interesting so it sounds like you, you you would i mean Maybe from the point of view of where you are now, you're saying that we were sort of repulsed by what we'd become if we actually accomplished that feat. But so you wouldn't, it's, I mean, and you, and that's kind of the picture you get from the, from the book as well, a neural path that, you know, by the time he's bootstrapped himself out of uh, all of these recognizably human things, he's a monster. Um, and that's not a desirable thing from our point of view, but it is, it's not, so it's not something that's better for us in the long run you don't think that where we are now is better for us well where we are now i mean we're like if you look at humanity as a, a kind of uh you social super organism right i mean uh, um i mean where we are now is where we were ancestrally right uh plus you know uh, these uh 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 ever more fundamental cognitive ecological changes you know um uh but we still all have the same operating system uh, basically and uh, um, once you know we start uh, individualizing our operate uh, our operating systems then you know I mean uh, I don't know I, I you know it, it's the singularity is uh, uh, to me the singularity is primarily uh, um, all about basically the point at which human self-understanding collapses as as a uh, uh, as a possibility right for for practical problem solving let alone theoretical problem solving and, and um uh you know things like you know facebook social media all this stuff i, I mean it's just all so rudimentary right i mean it's wax phonographs you know by the time we get to the blu-ray version of it we're just going to be so overmatched. I, I, I mean, uh, um, I just, uh, like, yeah, I, I want to. I got a little girl, for Christ's sakes, right? And, and a wife that's, that's constantly upbraiding me to be more positive. So I want to be positive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I just don't see any way we can, uh, we can actually escape what we're doing to uh, um, ourselves and our, our cognitive ecology. I mean, uh, um, especially with AI. I mean, especially, especially with AI. You know, and you know, to get back to that twenty percent that we were discussing just shortly before we started went live. Uh, um, I just don't think you know. Even if you could get that twenty percent to agree, <laughs> you know, I, I just think the vast bulk of humanity would find, you know, just even the premise of what I'm saying to you uh, uh, preposterous.
right? And would just simply misplace the blame for whatever types of short circuits are arising, right? And that would just simply compound those short circuits. You know, I, I mean, there's like a, a, a really problematic political dimension to, uh, to uh, all this, all this as well. So, yeah. Yeah, you're a sunny guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a good time wrecking ball. That's what my, my wife calls me. Good, good time, time wrecking, wrecking ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic about the technology stuff, but uh, I certainly see the potential for the sort of thing that you're talking about. Um, Did you check out Crash Space at, at all? or uh, It's a short story I, I submitted to uh, Midwest Studies and Philosophy. I think it's on my uh, academia uh, EDU page. Yeah, that's the one, uh, that's the episode, I mean, the issue that uh, Eric Switch Gable yeah. edited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't read it. I no, it's on my list. I mean that. So in that story, it's basically a, a a debate, right, between people who have been enhanced and and people who uh, um, haven't been enhanced, right? Humanist, you know, versus transhumanists, and and the whole point uh, of of that uh, debate is to show um, how in which the free will debate is same with neuropath i guess i do the same as something similar you know how the free will debate is actually being concretized by technology you know how um the question of you know a, a autonomy responsibility and authenticity um just become progressively more and more difficult to to uh clarify and answer i mean Anyone can gerrymander uh, a response, right? I mean, anyone can play Dennett's game of redefinition and come up with a friendly story, right? We can still use the word responsibility, right? We can still use the word freedom. We can still use these words. But all those attempts mistake our ability to theorize solutions, right, with the actual flesh and blood short circuiting, right, of these ways of understanding our our, uh, our social environments. So students, for instance, um, used to be able to, the teachers used to be able to call their students lazy or stupid, right? Yeah. But, but uh, not anymore. No. And, and even in, in rapid, rapidly, uh, I think even in accelerating uh, uh, time frame, um, you know, more and more impediments to student performance, right, are actually being medicalized. So we're actually understanding the the causal history of why, you know, little Joey stares out the window all the time instead of uh, uh, looking at what's on the smart board, right? Um, and as soon as you understand that, then all of a sudden you can't say, that's bad, don't do that, right? All of a sudden, why? Because we have this system Right, which you know, a moral cognitive system, uh, uh, which, is, when confronted with genuine causal explanations for behavior, leads us to exempt individuals from from that behavior. Right, so it's almost like this, you know, creeping exculpation is what uh, Dennett calls the problem, <clears throat> and he's just finally now starting to, I, I think, actually take it seriously. I think he might even be writing a book about this right now. But, but it, in the classroom, it's transforming the dynamics of the classroom. Character judgments are becoming more and more out of place, right? Perhaps even professionally disastrous to make in the classroom, right. right? And that, there's no limit to that. I mean, there isn't a single thing a student does, right? That is, you know, deleterious to their academic performance that can't possibly be medicalized <laughs> and explained in causal terms. And as soon as it's explained in those terms, then boom, that hits you basically hits the exemption queue and you're all of a sudden you can no longer make a character judgment. You can no longer use that powerful tool that you know our ancestors gave us to actually make a determination in the classroom, right? So where does it end? Right? Students have no responsibility at any point, <laughs> right? Um, I don't know, it, it certainly doesn't seem to be a sustainable trend. I mean, at some point, right, you're going to have to say, you know, you're responsible, <laughs> right? But uh, how are we supposed to use our moral int intuitions to reason through that? 
there's no satisfying way to do it, which means the masses are never going to get it. You know, wankers like you and I, we can take <laughs> this gerrymandered response and that gerrymandered response forever, right? But but the voting public, who's incredibly invested in their child's education, isn't going to put up with our our wankery, right? So it just seems like boom, that cognitive ecology. We're in the we're actually watching before our eyes, right? The semantic apocalypse creeping, you know, along. The, the obsolescence of our, you know, ancestral uh, socio-cognitive capacities um, in action. Um, another great example is uh, uh, sentencing, the use of uh, uh, neuroscience in sentencing, right? So rates of neuroscientific defenses of uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. going up more and more. And uh, um, if you can make a good neuroscientific argument, that, uh, that your client, you know, was, you know, basically disabled in this or that respect, right? You'll get a softer sentence. But when it comes to time for parole and they do the risk assessment, right? What do they do? They look at neurophysiology once again, <laughs> right? And they use the exact same data that gave you a lighter sentence in the courtroom. They use that to, to keep you in, <laughs> right? To increase the punishment. So all of a sudden, data in this context, which actually serves, to, I mean, who the hell is going to punish someone for having a disability, right? And then the same data in this context is like, well, geez, we got to make sure this punishment continues for as long as possible, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, um, how do you solve it? Well, all kinds of solutions out there, right? You, get rid of everything, but then the criminal justice system doesn't make sense to the populace anymore, right? It's right. just wankers who are talking about it, and they can't agree <laughs> on the moral dimensions of, they can agree on what's going on in terms of the physiology. Other than that, all they have is, you know, the likes of you and I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the problem, right? I, I don't know if you <laughs> caught this debate between Dan and uh, Greg Caruso, which was in, um, Aeon recently? Did you do you know Greg's no, work? No, no, no. I gotta look that up. I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it's a, it's a. I mean, Greg's idea is that you know punishment's a bad idea. I mean, he's a determinist, and uh, he thinks, well, look, you still have the prison system, but because of uh, quarantine, basically, so he has a quarantine model, where you know someone has an infectious disease, we we keep them out of the public. Uh, it's no fault of their own. We don't blame them that you have leprosy or whatever, you know, uh, Ebola. Um, but we still keep you quarantined uh, because you're a public public health threat. So his idea is to kind of take that approach towards um, the, the, the criminal justice system. Yeah, some people commit crimes. That doesn't mean they're morally responsible for their crimes, but they're still like infectious carriers of a disease. You have to quarantine them. Um, so this, the criminal justice system still makes sense, um, but, you, but you have to re-sort of interpret what punishment is and more, more responsibility and that sort of stuff is. So I don't know if that's what you call wankery or not. <laughs> yeah, but it is, it's totally gerrymandering a, 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 a set of rationalizations, right? In order to basically try to get our intuitions back in line with what we now know, right? So, you know, our, our intuitions, which are products of these shallow ecologies, right? These shallow co uh, uh, cognitive ecologies, flooded with all this deep ecological uh, information that we just simply did not have to worry about when, when uh, 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 we were pre-scientific. Uh, um, you know, the intuitions are just absolutely adrift. And so how do you make sense of it? Well, you call a philosopher and the philosopher gives you an interpretation. You call a different philosopher and you get a different interpretation. You call a different philosopher and you get a different interpretation, right? Each of those philosophers is convinced that, yeah, no, no, this is the best way of doing it, <laughs> right? But, but really in point of fact, the lesson is in that process itself, right? That very process is actually uh, 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 um, exemplifying Right, what happens when deep environmental information just really starts to uh, uh, flood our shallow cognitive ecologies? You know, it, um, all of a sudden, our you know typical you know ancestrally uh, uh, tuned responses to things like causal explanations of bad behavior, right? 
begin having all kinds of crazy side effects, right? Like right. no kid in your class is responsible, <laughs> right? Like short sentence, no parole. You know, I, I mean, uh, um, the fact that philosophers can actually, you know, try to take those systems, rework them in this way or that way or this way or that way to try to basically, you know, appease these sets of intuitions, well, that's kind of neither here nor there, right? I mean, because really what we're witnessing is basically the breakdown of uh, um, the ability of those systems to actually function, you know, the way it, it was, you know, by our standpoint, you know, enlightenment, uh, post-enlightenment standpoint, absolutely brutal. <laughs> ways of uh, resolving these issues that our ancestors had, right? Man, that, that's another problem, you know? You see, and, that, and that's the thing, it's it, it, it's funny, and it's what I try to do in Neuropath too, is, is uh, you know, all these philosophical arguments that were just abstractions 50, 60 years ago, right, are just staring us right in the eye right now. Yeah, they're concretized. Concretized, yeah, like uh, AI, uh, you know, driverless cars, right? How do you determine responsibility, you know? I, I mean, the legal system has to work for any any type of, uh, you know, uh, organized state to exist. It has to have a functioning legal system and people have to buy into that legal system in, in order to uh, maintain any type of legitimacy, right, for whatever the ruling hegemony happens to be. Um, you know, I don't know. I, and this is what worries me about Trump. This is why, you know, I, I don't think Trump is a blip. I think Trump is, you know, the first canary to die <laughs> in our coal mine. And it, uh, um, yeah, it's a warning. It's a, it's a warning, yeah. right? You know, I, I mean, uh, um, it's kind of funny how, uh, in fantasy circles, uh, the alt right actually uh, hijacked the uh, uh, Hugo's, the Hugo Awards, oh. basically using web resources, you know, um, so that the only writers who were nominated were uh, um, hard ass right wing authors, right, that had uh, ideology that was suitable, you know, for uh, that was recently. That was um, three years ago now. Wow. And uh, um, so when that happened, it, it, and then, you know, all of a sudden, like the alt-right, I've been battling the alt-right online for uh, for a long, long time now. And uh, um, I'll never forget, uh, you know, realizing just how many followers these, these lunatics had, you know, people who wanted to rescind the right to vote from women, right? Herd all minorities up into concentration camps. I mean, just the most despicable, mad, crazy views you could possibly imagine. And they had, you know, here I thought a million views on my my website, you know, uh, a few years back. And I was like, whoa, a million views, wow. You know, and next thing you know, I'm in a blog war with this uh, this dude who, who uh, is, you know, crawled out from underneath some kind of medieval rock. And uh, he's got 111 million views. Wow. On his on his blog, and I mean that's when I started to realize that I was like, "Holy cow!" You know, the, the, as the cost of reality plunges, right, the more responsive it becomes to you know basically baseline human desire. And we see what we want because that's what sells, and uh, um, that process. Um, how do you arrest that process? Right? How do you stop it? Right. Yeah. No, that's deeply depressing. I mean. That that's why I was want to be an optimist about the singularity and, and transhumanism is because I think the 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 project of the Enlightenment postulated a creature which never existed, you know, this rational creature yeah. that uh, that just plainly is not who we are, but it's who we could become under the right kinds of circumstances, yeah. which is what the reason why I'm interested in transhumanism um, in general is to try to to make the kind of creature who the enlightenment thought <laughs> humans already were, whether that's really success can succeed or not. And I agree. There's, you know, there's all the issues you brought up and all that, but that that's the reason why I think it's important because uh, all of the things which we're talking about are the product of our natural evolutionary history. 
And those are the things that we, I want to get rid of. Those are the things which, if I had the chance to, I would just jettison immediately. Yeah. Um, and then I think we'd be better off. Of course, you know, could we all do it at once or something? You know, how, how do we do that? But uh, that's the hope of it. Whether, whether it succeeds is a different question. I just don't understand. I, I mean, short, and once again, it's, you know, like I agree with you, it's possible to do, but I mean, you would need some incredibly draconian, like I say, you'd have to legislate the human soul. And, yeah. uh, I mean, um, it's, I and, that's, and that's inimical to the enlightenment, right? But that's yeah. what you're talking about. I mean, well, I mean, we already do that to some extent, right? We mandate that people go to school K through 12. And yeah. oh, yeah. So yeah. that's already pretty draconian in a sense. And what we're doing is, you know, instilling in them a bunch of uh, stuff which they might not have normally come across, you know, including math and language skills. And I, I guess I just don't see doing this sort of thing as really that drastic of a difference uh, as it's, uh, you know, Installing some hardware instead of installing some software. <laughs> well, well, the software though. If you look at the software, and, and, and I think that's a, a, a incredibly important point, right? I mean, um, we do legislate the human soul <laughs> in all sorts, all sorts of different ways, right? But I mean, if you look at the education system, I mean, in some ways, you know, what makes so much of the education system politically pernicious, right, is the fact that it so religiously avoids any type of you know politically relevant uh, uh, um, uh, content right I mean civics classes I mean most people come out of school not they don't know how a market economy works they don't know how uh, a, a, a uh, um, uh, government works and not only that they don't know the first thing about themselves right they don't know the types of oversimplifications that they're prone to make right the uh the kinds of uh parochialism that they'll run afoul of right, right? I, I mean they come out of school knowing nothing about how flawed they are as as a problem solver and um every time <laughs> a jurisdiction tries to do that tries to inject that it has political consequences and and uh, it, it ends up dying right i mean um, right. um once it once we start talking about you know rewiring humans right as opposed to just simply retraining humans i mean how would we rewire humans in in a way that isn't obviously political right simply from the get-go right, right yeah that's the problem yeah. i mean that's i just don't see how how you could do that uh outside some crazy authoritarian regime you know like uh maybe the chinese will be able to do it at some point i don't know <laughs> i don't think uh, i don't think the west is ever going to be able to muster the the wherewithal to do it i mean but you know but who knows i um you know, just uh, some major crisis or something like that, you know, uh, maybe that will, will give us the impetus or, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, it just seems one of those mountains that just seems too, too high to climb. Right. Yeah, no, I know that's, <clears throat> that's a, that's a daunting way of putting it. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, you could just sort of force everyone to do it and become like China in a sense, but with more rationally enhanced agents and then, you know, disband the government or something. That sounds crazy. No one would ever do that. They would do it the opposite. They would install a bunch of stuff that make you more easily controllable. More easily controllable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because that's, uh, I mean, that's the best way to attain uh, harmony, right? I mean, uh, um, if you look at it, I guess we could probably be easily rewired to, uh, uh, um, fall, run a foul hero worship, you know? So we just embarded by the great leader's image enough times we will worship them. <laughs> I mean, that might be a, a very simple fix, right? Yeah, exactly. Just one person, you know, but, uh, um, that isn't enhancement, <laughs> you know, when people, especially transhumanists, I mean, usually it's, you know, there's, there's usually a libertarian, uh, uh, strain lurking in the background. Right, and it's all all about uh, uh, maximizing uh, choices, right? And uh, uh, um, that's something that would have to uh, just have to die. I mean, what does choice even mean <laughs> once you get to that point, right? Uh, say you have an AI. Say you, you uh, um, Siri becomes smart enough to uh, become a, a life coach, 
right? Which is just around the corner. Yeah. And uh, uh, you can already subscribe to uh, apps that give you uh, 24 seven access to a therapist, right? To make you feel right. about yourself, right? I think it's a huge industry and if anyone wanted to make a million dollars, they should invest in it now, right? So I think it's gonna be absolutely massive. Um, but uh, uh, again, <laughs> that was an that idea. That more was... problems, or does it solve problems? Exactly. It, that it, was an idea that was explored in this uh, this book. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called All the Birds in the Sky. Have you heard of, heard of uh, forget who the woman is? The beautiful I'm title. Name. Um, but anyway, there's a version of that idea in there. I mean, it's kind of a fantasy sci-fi novel. She mixes magic in with uh, AI and stuff. But there's a point at which one of the AIs sort of becomes like an iPhone, it's ubiquitous, and it's always like giving unobtrusive relationship advice and steering you in the right direction to just meet oh. the person who would be the best person to meet you. So it's this kind of, sort of a, a version of what you're saying as we kind yeah, of well, the life coach. Yeah, well, that's the story about that very damn thing. It's, uh, uh, well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, the first, you can't be the first to, uh, <laughs> to write about these things ever anymore. But, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a, but, I mean, it's, it's um, yeah, these are, these are tough questions. But uh, uh, one of the things I think that's important is people like you are exploring these ideas in their, in their, in their fiction. Which you know, you can write a thousand philosophy essays, and some people can think very abstractly and kind of can think their way into it. But for the rest of us, you know, you need to have a, a story that puts you in the in this place, and that's I think some of some of your work does that. It, it explores these ideas and the depressive brutality of them from a from a, a point of view that that people can't help but take it seriously. And and the more I mean, how, no matter how depressing all this is, the more we think about it, the more we're uh, cognizant of it and talking about it, I think the better, uh, the better we off we are. That's what I hope. I, I don't know if I necessarily believe that, though. I, I, I mean, I, I really, I, I sometimes think if if I'm right about this semantic apocalypse stuff, right? If uh, uh, I, I mean, my goal is really, really simple. It's just simply to get everybody in in the intellectual world to think about cognitive ecology, right? And to basically throw humanism out the window. And start understanding, you know, their cognitive predicament as one of always being embedded in these superordinate systems, right? And those systems sometimes they allow us to to make you know ontic ontological uh, determinations, and sometimes they don't. When it comes to ourselves, right, they don't at all, right? And uh, um, uh, uh, because we're blind to that, it means that you know, these huge commercial interests can rewire our ecologies without any sort of accountability whatsoever. Um, geez, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on his name, but um, if you do anything after after this interview, uh, um, Google System Zero uh, um, and check out, uh, it's a blog post. What the hell, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. He kicked me in the nuts if he knew. <laughs> but System Zero, check it out. I, uh, um, it's it, it's uh, 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 basically outlines what the combination of big data and uh, um, uh, AI means, right? Within the framework of type one and type two cognition. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, he, you know, system zero is uh, basically type zero cognition, right? Where basically all of our automatic uh, systems have been so thoroughly enmeshed right with our commercial environments and we are so well known by all the algorithms that uh, that uh, uh, um, we're now embedded uh, within that uh, um, in a sense even though we all think that we're absolutely free what have you we are just kinds we've become uh, uh, commercial sock pu sock puppets in a way and um, yeah, it's just that, I mean, that trend, you know, where, you know, the crash of human social cognition becomes a commercial opportunity, right? And then that crash space ends up being translated into a cheat space, you know, uh, um, uh, just seems to be inexorable. I, I just don't know how you would stop it without somehow getting rid of capitalism itself. And uh, um, I don't see that happening. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, uh, um, 
but who knows you know in that kind of administered uh, uh, commercial slavery who knows maybe they are equilibria to be found there that that would enable uh, humans to hang on for for a while you know even if you know they're constantly you know bombarded by uh, uh, false narratives and false realities and what have you. I'm not sure what the politics would look like, but uh, um, maybe that's a potential way. But certainly not a desirable one, right? I mean, right. Uh, yeah. Hey, you know, the thing is, is that in the thing of, um, I think is just the most important uh, uh, point I guess I would want to make is, is to understand just how seamless you know, this part of our, our our conversation regarding semantic apocalypse, right, is with the blind brain part of the, of the conversation. Yeah. Right. So this this notion of being utter cognition being utterly blind to its constitutive and circumstantial dimensions, right? Short these you know metacognitive shortcuts that we use, right? We call them reason <laughs> and argumentation and stuff to troubleshoot these these uh, 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 problems we have uh, um, with our take on on the world right I mean that story is continuous with the story of the classroom for instance right I mean it's all part and parcel of a of, of, uh, picture of, of cognition that actually understands uh, um, what it is we experience or think we experience right in terms of what we can be reasonably uh, sure that is missing from that experience, right? Um, what it is we're neglecting every time we're solving something. And uh, um, uh, I think, you know, because it is such a parsimonious view, right? I mean, it, you know, it allows you to drastically simplify your ontology. Uh, um, but yet really does have this incredibly comprehensive reach, right? Um, I mean, that's the reason why I think I've actually solved it. I, I think I've solved the problem of intentionality, that, that there is, even though I, I, I'm still struggling with formulations of it, but there is, I think, a, 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 a general theory of cognition lurking uh, under the surface here. And uh, um, I encourage everyone to, to uh, log on to Three Pound Brain and uh, 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 debate it with me because uh, Lord knows I need uh, I need help. <laughs> yeah, the tagline on on this is convince me I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please convince me I'm wrong. I think you. Please. <laughs> it is it's soul sucking, man. It, it, it really, <laughs> I, I mean, you get the uh, intellectual buzz, right, of uh, of killing multiple birds with single stones, but but uh, yeah, no, it's it's soul sucking. It really is because. You know, every time I attempt to think of what a post-intentional philosophy would look like, it just it just ends up looking like a horror show. I mean, yeah. <laughs> inhuman. And 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 the thing is, is that we sh I don't think we should be surprised. I mean, I think any species that you know shares you know uh, um, our uh, our developmental pattern is bound to run into this wall with you know, the metacognitive shortcuts that their ancestors evolved, right, to deal with problems um, at the constitutive and circumstantial level that they absolutely neglect otherwise, you know. Right? Think of the fly in a wall, right? That's such a curious saying, you know. Um, I was thinking about this with uh, Trump and Putin having that two hours uh, alone together, right, <laughs> you know. What would it be like to be a fly in the wall and hear that? And why do you say that, right? I mean, because if you were there in the room, you'd be tackled and imprisoned, right? I mean, you'd want to be a fly on the wall because you don't want to actually impact any of the systems that you're observing, right? And so the idea is, is you'd actually be able to somehow cognize the fact of what's going on there in that situation. You'd see these systems independently of your own system. Right, and so the fly in the wall is a great analogy for basically what we're all after in a way. You know, the scientists in the laboratory. You know, we're all trying to figure out how these systems operate independent of whatever impact we may have on our own on our uh, own ecology. 
And uh, 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 so the ideal is to be a fly on the wall system. <laughs> and uh, what that basically means is that, you know, what we're trying to do is basically align our, you know, our biology in our circumstances in such a way that our biology and our circumstances don't impinge on our ability to cognize, right, those, those circumstances, right, to negate the possibility of, of uh, observer effects. The thing is, is we're blind to our constitution and we're largely blind to our circumstances, right? Didn't even know what evolution was, you know, 145 years ago or what have you, right? Um, uh, uh, so our ancestors had to do that. They had to figure out ways to be flies in the wall without any clue as to what it was they were trying to do, right? They were trying to find ways to put themselves in these situations where they could cognize their environments without impacting them in ways that rendered them dependent upon their own activity. They had to do that because since they're blind to their own constitutive and circumstantial dimensions, they had no way of cognizing <laughs> their impact, right? We have all kinds of ways of knowing, you know, you push something, it'll move and, and what have you. And, and I mean, that's absolutely crucial to understanding how we're going to survive in any environment, right? But those systems themselves, as they operate independently of our interactions with them, uh, it becomes impossible as soon as we interact with them, simply because we are blind, right, to ourselves, source blindness. We can source our environments, but we can't source ourselves. So when we impact our environment, suddenly we can't source what's going on in our environment, right? And so we have to develop these elaborate uh, uh, um, scaffolds, uh, uh, ways in which to, you know, basically, you know, abstract ourselves from our environments or, you know, uh, protocols for just not impinging on our environments whatsoever, right? All these ways to become flies on the wall. And to be a fly on the wall is to be safely blind <laughs> to one's own constitution and one's environment, right? To be uh, uh, constituted and endowed such that your constitution or endowment is irrelevant to what it is you're trying to cognize. If there's a problem and you can't cognize these systems independently of yourselves, right, then there's a problem. You gotta go back and you gotta look at this, what you're blind to basically and solve it somehow, right? And I mean, for me, this is what reason, the best way to look at reason and, and rationality it is basically these really uh, low D ways of trying to nudge each other back into that fly in the wall position right um, without realizing that that's what we're we're trying to do since we neglect that blindness right it doesn't seem like when we reflect it that there's any blindness at all it seems we suffer why siati right uh, what you see is all there is uh, effects of all kinds uh, uh, of uh, varieties and and <clears throat> So to me, to understand cognition, you have to, uh, to understand the experience of cognition, you have to understand what it is that experience systematically occludes or, or, or uh, um, overwrites. Um, and once you do that, then suddenly the first personal, which seems to be radically incommensurable with, with uh, uh, the third person, um, makes a whole hell of a lot of sense, right? What's the first person? The first person is basically a kind of neglect structure, right? It's, it's basically uh, um, the shallow ecological view that we have just simply by virtue of uh, being human beings, right? Uh, um, with, that are largely blind <laughs> to themselves uh, in their environments, attempting to make sense of some wee corner of, of, uh, of our environments. And I mean, that, I would argue is the upshot. That's what cognitive science wants. Right? I mean, not just simply to understand how things work, because we can understand that, right? But how to understand how things work in context of our self-understanding, 
uh, of, uh, of how things work. And that's where all the problems uh, align, right? Correct, incorrect, the hell's that? You know, uh, right, wrong, you know, uh, uh, um, feelings, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, all these low D phenomena that we have, right? How do we plug it in to the, the high dimensional world that science is, is uh, uncovering? Well, you have to actually look at those low dimensional phenomena as dimensional reductions <laughs> of what's going on high, high dimensionally, right? And uh, um, when, when you understand that, then suddenly things like belief and uh, uh, phenomena, phenomenality, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you can say, <laughs> you know, that they're not real in any high dimensional sense, right? They're shallow information artifacts, right? That allow us to solve, you know, all kinds of ancestral problems and that we've bootstrapped in all kinds of ways to solve all kinds of different problems, right? But actually don't really have uh, any uh, um, uh, high dimensional correlate, right? There's no belief anywhere in the brain. <clears throat> There's no belief anywhere in nature. There's no belief anywhere. Right. Even though there is all the time when you're actually working within these heuristic systems to solve problems, you know, they become incredibly useful. It's just like thinking that money has value. Right. Money doesn't have value. Right. Money does what it does by virtue of its position within a super complicated system of interactions. Right. But no one knows that you go to a grocery store and you hand a person money and they give you milk. Right. Well, yeah, the money did that. <laughs> right. I mean, it's incredibly simplistic, you know, uh, um, and uh, Andrew Kempion and his inherence heuristics. Right. This is uh, what he's re uh, researching the ways in which we essentialize um, and uh, impute spontaneities to our environment, right, as ways to uh, bootstrap different types of solutions to uh, our environments. I would argue if uh, uh, you give that view a chance, you, you look at that view, uh, um, uh, the longer you look at it, and especially explore the continuities between the, between the you know, the utmost private, the phenomenological, to social semantic apocalypse, right? That uh, um, you'll agree that I'm on to something, <laughs> even if I'm not characterizing it right, because I'm not convinced I am characterizing it right, right? I mean, uh, uh, um, but I think there's something, there's got to be something to this, this way of looking at things. You know, um, fly on the wall, semantic apocalypse, uh, um, heuristic neglect. Uh, um, for some reason, there's just a lot of explanatory power uh, that lies between those three poles, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a nice way of summing up a lot of what we've been talking about over mm -hmm. the last uh, the couple of hours here. Holy moly, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, problem. No, no, I didn't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that I think what you were saying just now really puts into a nice context the things that we've been talking about um and i i agree that i think that these ideas are worth exploring and they're very interesting so i'm glad that you're uh you're out there trying to get these ideas out because the, uh, like i said before of thinking about them is is beneficial at least i think so um it, it may be a somewhat depressing um but of course uh you know there's there's no guarantee that life should not be depressing <laughs> yeah well look at copernicus right i mean uh, uh i don't think darwin brought brought much joy to many lives uh. <laughs> on the other hand you know there there is a certain joy in coming to understand some of these things but also maybe it's if we spread these ideas around if someone will think of a good answer um yeah maybe you're, you're <laughs> Right. I mean, uh, one of the things I'd like to be able to do is uh, think of think of types of experiments that you can use to uh, to uh, just simply uh, test a lot of the specific uh, predictions that the, that the theory makes. Right. I mean, I mean, some stuff seems to me just just kind of has to be true. I mean, it just can't be the sense. It can't be the case that we develop the metacognitive capacity to apprehend ourselves. Right. Um, uh, it, it can't be the case that the, you know, subject object, you know, intentionality 
you know, that that heuristic, right, um, uh, is omni applicable. I mean, it, it, it just it's just too too bloody simple, and it, it's fraught with so many problems that it, it, to me it just screams heuristic misapplication. Uh, um, you know, when you when we start talking about ourselves and thinking that we can take a fly on the wall position vis-a-vis -vis ourselves, huh? I mean, what? how could you make sense of that, right? How could you basically, you know, orient yourself, you know, in uh, such a way that your, you know, constitution and circumstances, right, don't actually impact right, whatever it, it is you're trying to cognize, because it's your constitution <laughs> that you're trying to trying to cogn cognize, right. right? So we have no way of taking a, a fly in the wall stance vis-a-vis -vis ourselves. I, mean, I think it just simply falls out of the view, right, the, the uh, um, it, um, whole whole uh, baskets of uh, theories of, uh, of introspection um, and uh, approaches to metacognition, I think, uh, fall by the wayside once once you pose yourself as a kind of ecology nested within an ecology, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, one of the perils of uh, being a fantasy author <laughs> and engaging in these topics is that you have to <laughs> you have to do a little more work to to uh, convince people that it's not just fantasy, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get, I get that a lot. I mean, you'd be amazed. You'd be like, "Oh, it sounds like you, you got another book to write." You know. I mean. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's clear mm -hmm. that you've done your homework on the neuroscience part of it, and I think that even though you know we can have disagreements here and there, the theory is not just fantasy. There's something mm -hmm. that empirically based that's that's sound here. Yeah, it's just a weird concept conceptual twist, right? I mean, I think it's the one that Dennett's been actually straining to find for, for years and years, right? And he keeps talking about inversions of thought, right? But uh, um, without being able to characterize what that inversion should look like uh, in uh, specific terms, right? right. But here, the, here the inversion is quite simple, right? I mean, it's you look neglect structures. Once you start thinking in terms of neglect structures, right, and the ways in which uh, uh, um, neglecting things uh, makes leads us to make all kinds of mistakes, right? You don't see detail, you think it's simple, right? Uh, you don't see a source, you think it's spontaneous. You know, uh, um, you don't see alternatives, you think it's the only game in town. Um, you uh, 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 don't have any way of flagging insufficient information, right? Metacognition wasn't evolved for philosophical purposes, right? So you assume sufficiency. Right, because these are the systems you evolved to use. Why should you assume they're insufficient to a task, right? Just simply because culture has nudged you in a direction to apply it in a way it hasn't been applied before. Um, I mean, all these things I think uh, uh, have to be taken accounted for, you know, when when viewing any any topic in philosophy of mind. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, so we have been going on for quite some time now, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't want to keep you forever. I'm no, no, vice versa. <laughs> no, actually, vice versa. <laughs> vice versa. Uh, uh, I could talk with you all day. You have a lot of interesting things to say. Um, but I wonder if there's anything, I mean, we've covered almost a lot, almost everything. But I wonder if there's anything which hasn't come up yet, which you want to uh, flag, bring up. Um. Well, I mean, presently working on a nonfiction book, uh, um, I probably should mention that, um, uh, uh, it's provisionally entitled The uh, End of Meaning. And, um, and so it's, you know, uh, an attempt to uh, um, basically lay out the whole picture, right, from the, the neural phenomenology part to, to the semantic apocalypse. Oh, very interesting. And, uh, um, and to, do so, to do so in uh, um, a accessible way as I, as I can possibly uh, manage. Because I think accessibility is, uh, is, really is one of, the, one of the big challenges that uh, I think the, the view faces. So, and then um, the other thing I'd say is, uh, 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 Three Pound Brain, uh, brain is my uh, my blog um, because I have been rebuilding my barn. I uh, um, haven't uh, actually been posting there. As... And you mean that literally? Yeah, <laughs> not <yeah>. figuratively. 
yeah no it's uh it's it's nice working with your hands after uh you know extended periods in the you know cerebral uh, uh mists but uh, <laughs> uh um three pound brain is uh um i don't know good community i, I i'm uh, inordinately proud of uh of of the blog and uh, in some ways it's just simply a philosophical scrapbook but uh get some interesting people weighing in with opinions and uh yeah, it's uh, a great blog I'll, I'll put a link to it under this discussion by the way but yeah. i highly recommend it as well it's a great blog and uh, um i uh, am constantly on the lookout for um links you know uh um links about the ways in which you know cognitive ecologies are being uh compromised and um and, and um also uh uh evidence for and against uh the you know the basic the basic view of metacognition that, that i uh, that i put forward so um it, it really is just endless amounts to talk about though that's that's part of the problem i think with, <laughs> with the human <laughs> Too damn complicated for uh, for humans to solve, right? So. Yes. <laughs> well, it means oh, yeah, we won't be out of work anytime soon, or at least no. we won't be out of a hobby anytime soon. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be wrecking good times for years to come. <laughs> for years to come. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, awesome. uh, on Excellent. that note, I want to thank you again for for joining me, Scott. This has been an excellent discussion. I learned a lot by interacting with your work and. By talking with you so uh, i just want to say i really appreciated it um and if you ever get that book together i'd love to look at a copy of it uh, yeah yeah sure sure and thank you thank you for uh giving me a platform for uh, uh squeaking uh, uh some craziness uh i've been conscious of my chair cracking and popping in the background i don't know if you can hear it or not i haven't heard it at all no haven't you? okay no. so maybe the problem. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to wait for posterity to let us know I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. Us, uh, eventually and that damn chair but uh other than that no i haven't noticed it <laughs> it is a chair too <laughs> it is a chair okay right yeah. <laughs> that's important <laughs> uh, okay well on that note thanks again okay